Hello and welcome. Researchers at Oxford University have uh, concluded that an inexpensive steroid, dexamethasone, is helping patients with severe lung damage survive the illness. Now, dexamethasone is a 60-year-old drug and the trials apparently have shown that it reduced the risk of death for patients on ventilators by one-third and the risk of patients on oxygen by one-fifth. So the question is, is dexamethasone that wonder drug that we've been waiting for? And if so, uh, or if not, uh, what are the lessons that we can take away at this point, given our own experience in India dealing with COVID for the last 90 days? To discuss this, I'm joined by Dr. Behram Pardiwala, internal medicine expert at uh, Work Heart Hospitals. Dr. Pardiwala, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, your first reaction to this uh, new finding that dexamethasone is actually helping patients who are in critical care. Thank you very much for asking me to talk to you. One thing you must understand is dexamethasone is a steroid, as you mentioned. There are various classes of steroids. This is one of the steroids. Now, the press always seems to, you know, think that every next drug is a new discovery. It's going to do wonders in this fight against COVID. It's not like that. Initially, the Americans were extremely reluctant to use steroids. And they said, in fact, that it causes positive harm. And the guidelines initially used to say that it should be banned from use as far as COVID was concerned. In India, we have been using steroids since COVID was arrived with us. We use small doses, we use large doses, depending upon the patient's clinical condition. If you remember, there was this great hullabaloo about biopsy, uh, sorry, autopsies in these patients showing changes in the lungs suggestive of a coagulation disorder, blood clots, etc. All mm -hmm. this basically because of some sort of an inflammatory process which is occurring, as well as what we call the IC disseminated intramuscular coagulation. In that sort of a situation, steroids do help. And where you have these patients who come in requiring high doses of oxygen, 8 liters, 12 liters per minute, and you have these patches in the lungs and you can see them even in the CT scan, some of these patients when given steroids improve remarkably. And in fact, we try and give it early on because the earlier you give it, the more effective it seems to be, like in any drug, in any disease. Hit hard, hit fast. That's the idea. So from that point of view, yes, it's an excellent drug and we have been using it right from the beginning. In our hospital, our intensive is Dr. Kedar Toraska, who is also part of the, the team at, to advise the state government, has suggested that we use initially solumetrol, which is metal prednisolone, as an injection. And then we taper it down and start giving oral drugs. You must understand that not when a patient becomes critical, everything is not a cytokine storm. Right. IL-6 IL is an uh, entity which we use to measure how high the patient's inflammatory response is. And we have seen that patients with very high IL-6 also do not necessarily fit into a cytokine storm. However, one must understand that when you use it, it is a double-edged sword. Because if you have an infection existing inside you, it can flare up with steroids. So you have to delicately balance it. But overall, yes, it's a very good drug to use, and we have been using it from day one. And uh, uh, Dr. Pardiwala, you've been using the same drug. Uh, I know that I know many doctors have spoken to have spoken of steroids uh, right from the beginning. But is it this? Is it this very drug that's dexamethasone or some it variants as well? Doesn't matter. You have prednisolone, you have dexamethasone, you have methylprednisolone. All of them are steroids. Okay. Right. It's just the degree of effectiveness. So say 10 milligrams of prednisolone may equal. Uh, be equivalent to four milligrams of the dexamethasone will be equivalent to two milligrams of methylprednisolone, etc. So it really doesn't matter which steroid you use. You understand? If, right. for example, if, if uh, how shall I explain to you? It's like trying to use a generic version of of uh, uh, teramycin or tetracycline, which is called differently. So Understood. from two, yes. 
Right. So uh, amongst the patients, I mean, uh, is there, are the patients who you've been administering with this drug or your colleagues have been administering, have they been mostly uh, older or is it is it something? I mean, I'm also asking this question today, which may be a, may be a little different from, let's say, uh, a, the similar, a similar question posed about 60 days ago. What was exactly the question? So my question is: uh, Is the uh, is the drug being administered mostly to older people, younger people? Are there any common uh, factors amongst? Uh... I think I think we are using it in those patients who are critically ill, where we feel that they, uh, you know, severe coughing, low saturations, high demand of oxygen, yes, high CRP levels, yes, not sky high levels of uh, IL-6. Procalcitonin is another marker suggesting infection. If you have a high, very high procalcitonin, then we are a little cautious. Not so high, we go in and with our guns blazing and give the steroids. And whether it is an old patient or whatever, it doesn't make a difference. We use it and we find that it works well. Right. So uh, let me put the question a little, uh, or rather, let me add something to the question. So uh, how are you seeing uh, cases today? I mean, between the last time I spoke to you and today, the number of cases have obviously risen quite uh, sharply in the in the city. So uh, how are you seeing the flow and uh, the treatment efforts? Right. So, so the number of cases has dramatically increased, right? We have ramped up and at the moment we are getting about 120 indoor, we cater to 120 indoor patients. Now, ideally speaking, this sort of a drug should be used in the intensive care unit, right? Our intensive care unit can accommodate 31 critically ill patients, quite a few on the ventilator, etc. So obviously, there is a backflow out into the wards. In the intensive care unit, my colleague Dr. Toresco looks after, outside I look after. So therefore, we have been forced by circumstances to start using it outside also. That is where my familiarity with the drug comes in. And we have found, you know, we discussed between ourselves with our intensive care colleagues, and we have found that if whatever sort of patient it is, we're getting more ill patients now, right? Because people are realizing that if you have, if you're COVID positive, it really doesn't matter. You can do quarantine at home. You can do anything. That is what, in fact, the municipal corporation is telling us to do. So we are getting the patients who are more ill. And that is why we are using this drug more and more. Initially, if we were using right. it ten percent of patients, we are almost using it fifty percent now. Right, uh, and and uh, you know, I also read that uh, this was a banned substance in the sporting context. Does that mean anything at all for treating COVID or uh, the world that you're in? Actually, 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 what you are talking about are anabolic steroids. Those are mm -hmm. the steroids which build muscle. Those are totally different from these steroids. Okay. So and, yeah. and you're saying that uh, dexamethasone has no connection with any uh, any sporting related concerns or pre, can, uh, you know so. can use these sort of steroids in the sporting community, but why it was banned over there was because they would use it as say a, a little bit of a performance, right. injury, but it reduces inflammation, so it reduces pain. So you know in the sporting event, if you're running a marathon, it would reduce your pain if you take a shot of a steroid, right? right? Of this sort of a steroid. Now, it, in our situation, it, it hardly matters. Right. They're using it for, for, for performance enhancements. We want performance enhancements. We <laughs> want the patient to right. pay for Right. Uh, a, a general question, uh, Dr. Pardiwala, not specifically linked to dexamethasone. Uh, how are you seeing the overall uh, flow of patients today? I mean, uh, what is your sense of success uh, in terms of those who are getting cured or those who are you are uh, managing to bring back from uh, critical care levels? We are seeing, as I told you earlier, we are, we are getting more critically ill patients and we have been successful in reviving quite a few of them. Now with the use of drugs such as toxicity and, and steroids, etc., we have been able to prevent the patients going on the ventilator because going on the ventilator somehow in any country, you know, it, it, it disposes towards a fatal outcome. So we have been able to prevent such patients going on to the ventilator. So from that point of view, we've been very successful and we have been able to pull out quite a few people, quite a few people. We are getting the older patients now. 
with very many comorbid conditions, chronic obstructive lung disease, diabetes, whom we can manage to pull out quite easily now without the use of this remdesivir and, and toxicity. Right, that's uh, that's really encouraging to hear, uh, Dr. Pradiwala. Last question. So, uh, you know, as you've seen the flow of patients and you did say that more critically ill patients are coming, your advice to those who feel that they are, uh, li I mean, are feeling like they have the symptoms or maybe are concerned about their health, uh, what should they be doing, particularly now that we are in a post-lockdown uh, phase where we are all going out and mixing with people and so on. So how should we be going about our lives, number one? Number two, if we suspect something, what should be our next course of action? Well, let's take the first thing first. When you go out into the world, I mean, you're like a newborn baby now. So you have to take all your precautions. Make sure you are masked, yes? Make sure you take your hand sanitizer with you. Avoid going into crowds. If you have anybody who's even suspiciously going as a cough or a, a sniffle, stay away from them, right? And whenever you touch a surface, especially in public transport, trains, buses, taxis, always sanitize your hands. When you're going into office, I hope your office has taken adequate precautions, but otherwise you take a precaution, sanitize your table with a sanitizer, sanitize your surroundings. Every time you use the telephone, sanitize it, yes? Try not to use your mobile phone, or if you do, keep it in a clear plastic bag, those sort of things. And if you, the second part of your question was, what happens if you feel that you got this? Well, ideally, you should check yourself. You should get yourself checked. Now, at the moment, I think today only, they have approved an antigen-based test, right? Where I can draw your blood, and in half an hour, I'll tell you if you have had COVID infection or not. That is, it, it, it's like sort of a screening tool. The golden standard today, the gold standard is still a swab from the throat and reverse transcriptase for the MRS chain reaction. So if you are negative on that, then in that case, if, you, if I'm still suspicious, I'd go for the RT-PCR still. But if you're positive in that, that means that you've been infected already. And then we need to check out your immune levels. That is where they are doing all these uh, plasma trials, if you know. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, uh, would you recommend that people, you know, go to a hospital straight away? And till what point? I think there seems to be some, uh, you know, confusion about at what point should I actually think about going to a hospital? Till what time sh uh, point should I be staying at home, you know, isolating myself uh, and watching my, let's say, oxygen levels or my fever levels and so on? Look, a lot of it is a bit of a hysteria. Naturally, anybody will feel scared, isn't it? And a lot of people can conjecture and get all sorts of symptoms, right? So it is better that you consult a doctor, let them figure right. out whether your symptoms are actually worthy of doing a test. If you have no fever, if you're just complaining of a little sat shortness of breath and your saturation is 95%, 96%, a normal COPD patient will have 93, 94%. They are used to that level. So why get flustered about it? Under those circumstances, stupid rushing to the hospital and overwhelming the services and getting the test. However, your saturation is low, you're old, you're running temperature, you have a headache, you have a backache. There's a strong suspicion. You should definitely get checked. So a little bit of a triage by a medical practitioner would help a huge amount. Right. Uh, Dr. Pardiwala, thank you very much for uh, joining us, sharing your thoughts. And I, as always, uh, wish you and your colleagues all the very best in this fight against uh, coronavirus. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much.